Benny, as Benjamin Franklin Bosch was called, like any grandson, admired his grandfather. But when your grandfather is the famous founder and your namesake, there's a certain extra bit of admiration that would propel him to get into his grandfather's old stomping grounds of printing. He met Grandpa when he was just five. Just as the independence movement was hitting the colonies, he was too young to walk the streets then with Thomas Young, James Cannon, or any of those Philadelphia radicals that we had talked about in a previous episode, but he'd soon get the same taste for liberty. He accompanied the elder Franklin to France and was schooled at his grandfather's insistence in Geneva, in the Republican country of Switzerland. It would not take long, 21 years, for him to start a newspaper. The General Advertiser and Political, Commercial, Agricultural, and Literary Journal. But he soon got tired of book reviews and crop reports and advertisers selling this and wanting that. And he began to focus on the political and sharpen his views. He renamed the paper The Aurora. As his grandfather passed, and he inheriting the printing equipment, he set his sights on the developments in the country. He hated what Alexander Hamilton was setting up. The industry, the banks. He disliked the pretentious look of the American government. And unlike others, he did not hold back from criticizing even the hero of the American Revolution, George Washington. Why should we celebrate his birthday, the paper asked. Why should people bow before him as they seemed to do on his trip down south? The parade, the well-dressed carriage, it favors too much of the monarchy, Bosch thought. And he stated the obvious, uh, that few would. The defender of liberty kept his slaves in chains. And though he was told not to do it, Benjamin Franklin Bosch published the full text of the Jay Treaty with Britain as the Senate was considering it. The treaty with America's former king was not popular in the nation. Yet being feisty, being political, being controversial was good for his media business. Nearly 2,000 subscribers and a lot more copies passed around through Philadelphia's streets and nearby towns three times what any of the other papers had and his sometimes reader was President Washington himself he was not happy Bashi said was a tool of those willing to destroy the democratic nation I have suffered every attack that was made upon my executive conduct to pass unnoticed while I remained in office Washington writes to William Gordon. Was it because of the virtues of a free press? Well, not exactly. To Gordon, he confesses. His live-let-live strategy was more because the charges made in the paper would not stand up to the test of investigation. Fake news, 18th century style, and only said in private, but a similar argument. The worst was when Bosch published forged letters that had already been published during the revolution by a New York newspaper. In other words, just kind of retweeting false information using the same previous source for credibility. It was published somewhere, right? These letters showed Washington had ulterior motives for taking the generalship to enrich himself or to seize power. Gordon is writing Washington helpfully, saying to the former president and former general, if you have more letters, you know, publish them all, get the whole story out. Washington in the letter is informing Gordon that these letters are spurious, and rather than respond, he just put a note in the record as he left office. He sent a short memorandum to the Secretary of State. Bosch attacks him constantly during the presidency that he's taking more money than he's supposed to. There's lots of hints and allegations about the entire Washington administration. Even as Washington writes his farewell address, 
Bosch's response to this popular address in all the other papers, he just says, It must be remembered that it is the profession of republicanism and the practice of monarchy that is the mode of this administration. Indeed, the administration held the Constitution in such low regard that it had reduced it to a nose of wax. Neither of them knew it, but they were beginning a long and storied history of turbulence between presidents and the press. One that now, instead of private letters, comes out in public tweets. The press, the enemy of the people. Oh, that phrasing is a little unique, but the feeling is not. George W. Bush muttering an expletive about a reporter. Lincoln fuming and quoting the Bible in vain. There's been a lot of history a presidential hating on the press, and some vice versa. Lots of, why print this? Don't print that. Stop attacking me. Print the good news for once. Lots of presumption that the president is the nation. When you attack me, you attack the republic. Some intimidation, some threats, even a friendliness that could be just as sinister. And Bosch doesn't close down his press when Adams takes over the presidency, but he does have higher hopes. Adams is an aristocrat, Bosch says, only in theory, but Washington was one in practice. Adams would not be a puppet. He likes that when Adams becomes president, he calls Congress together, consults with Congress, instead of being buried and hidden in his cabinet. That honeymoon would not last long. France, now a republic under the directory government, doesn't like our neutrality treating with Britain. They start messing with American shipping, seizing American ships that are on the high seas and those that are in French ports. Dozens of ships are dealt with in this fashion. Americans are outraged. Cities, Baltimore, Newburyport, uh, Massachusetts, Philadelphia, they raise monies to outfit privateers to attack French warships. The U.S. Navy is given three new ships, the Constellation, the Constitution, and the United States. The Constellation takes on a French ship and destroys it outside the New Jersey coast. Marines seize a city and stump the cannons, and now the Dominican Republic, in one of the few land raids in what will be called the Quasi-War with France. It is mentally a real war in terms of the politics within the early United States, and there are political consequences. When American diplomats are thrown out, told that they had to pay to talk to the new government by Foreign Minister Talleyrand, the entire country is insulted. This catches the Republicans, the Jeffersonians. Jeffersonians now VP, but he's not exactly, he's performing the duties of the office, but not cooperating with John Adams. This throws them off guard a bit. They had had all the popular support. The Federalists were those elitists. Now the issue has turned. They demand to see proof. And when the report is sent and publicized, because it's a diplomatic document, we don't want to insult another country, the French names, the names of the diplomats on the French side are blacked out and just referred to as X, Y, and Z. This document, published in papers, becomes the XYZ affair and fuels more outrage. Washington is asked to head the armies again. A shot across the bow to France. We have the aforementioned cities and towns across the U.S. developing fleets that are having some success at taking on French warships. John Adams wears a uniform and carries a sword. He's popular for the first and perhaps the only time in his presidency. But Benjamin Franklin Bosch and his Aurora paper are not happy. Adams has thrown the mask aside, he says. 
he ignores the depraved British actions against our merchants and capturing our sailors, but condemns the French. His attacks on Adams now are so strong that Abigail Adams says, if that fellow and all of his agents are not suppressed, we will come to civil war. She wouldn't have to wait long. Adams is one president who gets a great midterm in his first year, uh, even if that midterm was one that was stretched uh, between 1798 and 1799, between all the different states had their midterm elections. Still, swept up by war fever, with towns sending congratulatory notes in support of President Adams, and with the injury suffered by seaport residents up and down the coast, the House is now filled with more Federalists. The war men are in power, Thomas Jefferson regrets. And as they began to use their new majority, they targeted two offending groups. Immigrants, particularly French immigrants, and the press. And among many other things that the Alien Sedition Act says is Section 2. That if any person shall write, print, utter, or publish, or shall cause or procure to be written, printed, uttered, or published, or shall knowingly and willingly assist or aid in writing, printing, uttering, or publishing any false, scandalous, and malicious writing or writings against the government of the United States, or either House of the Congress of the United States, or the President of the United States, with the intent to defame said government, or either of the houses of said Congress or the said president, or to bring them or either of them into contempt or disrepute, or to excite against them or either or any of them the hatred of the good people of the United States, or to excite any unlawful combinations therein for opposing or resisting any law of the United States, shall be punished by a fine not exceeding $2,000 and by imprisonment not exceeding two years. John Adams is somewhat concerned about it, but he signs the law for Abigail. It was a fine moment. Let the vipers cease to hiss, she says. One of those vipers she surely had in mind was Matthew Lyon, congressman from Vermont. He had published letters that said Adams was grasping for power. Every consideration for public welfare had been swallowed up in this quest for power, in an unbridled thirst for pomp and selfish adverse. Ooh, about a president? U.S. Attorney Charles Marsh indicts Lyon, and Lyon goes to trial. He was not reserved in any manners. No one would say that about this congressman, and he certainly was not here at his trial. The law, he argued, is unconstitutional. And the judge, Peterson, instructed the jury that constitutional matters were not in the purview of the court to decide. Simply, did Lyon write this, and was it seditious? Well, Lyon argues in court, it wasn't a lie. For instance, he asks the judge himself. The part about the pomp. Well, haven't you observed pomp at the White House? After all, judge, you have dined there. No, the judge said he did not observe any. Certainly, it displays more servants in pomp than a Vermont tavern. No answer. And when the jury, on the narrow instructions given by the judge, convicts Lyon, the judge now wants to set an example for others, not to be seditious. A thousand dollar fine and four months in prison. Lyon would serve that time. In fact, he'd run for re-election from prison in a campaign against the federal justice system. And he'd win. But as soon as he was let out... He was indicted again for treason based on that campaign. This time, when the marshals came to Vermont, he was not to be found. Lyon fled to Kentucky, where he ran for Congress again, and now a free speech hero was elected from there. Another Philadelphia editor, Thomas Cooper, 
got six months and $400 for attacking Adams. But one of the more famous victims of this Alien and Sedition Act, a recent Scottish immigrant named James Callender, who wrote in the Richmond Examiner and was supported financially by Jefferson and Jefferson's supporters. He was arrested after he wrote a seditious column. The U.S. Attorney for Virginia had been instructed by the Secretary of State in the Adams administration, Pickering, to scan the examiner for any seditious writings. Callender's trial was a farce. Judge Samuel Chase interrupted his defense lawyers, said they didn't know what they were arguing. They didn't know what they were doing before this court. He made arguments for the prosecution that the prosecution didn't even make. In the end, Callender got nine months and also $400 fine. The law was temporary, and thus the Alien and Sedition Act was never fully ruled unconstitutional. It's something we're going to discuss later. It expires in 1801, and Callender's released, where he would go on to attack Jefferson, leading Jefferson to at least consider maybe a sedition law here or there, perhaps on a state level. But not at this time. Jefferson is VP when the sedition law is passed. He does not directly interfere. He cannot directly interfere as vice president or feels he cannot. He does not speak as vice president or feels he cannot, but gets with Madison. And together they craft two resolutions, one for Virginia and one for Kentucky. The Virginia and Kentucky resolutions seek to annul the federal law to make it null and void. Abigail Adams decries them as mad resolutions, but although constitutionally they don't really hold water, a state cannot simply nullify federal law. There's no provision for that. They do stand as a pretty good defense of free speech. If the acts specified should stand, these conclusions would flow from them, that the general government may place any act they think proper on the list of crimes and punish it themselves, whether enumerated or not enumerated by the Constitution, that they may transfer its cognizance to the president or any other person who he himself may be the accuser, counsel, judge, and jury, whose suspicions may be the evidence, his order, the sentence, his officer, the executioner, and his breast, the sole record of the transaction. Again, we do look at those Kentucky and Virginia resolutions as a failure on a constitutional level or an attempt to do something that you can't do, and that's valid. But they also are a pretty good defense of free speech in a time of madness. For Benjamin Franklin Bosch, there would be no trial nor release. He was indicted, but he was caught up in a deadly yellow fever epidemic in 1798 and died at age 30. In 1861, the eyesore of Lincoln and the Union government, the federal government, the Republican administration in Washington, D.C., the sight that made them cringe was the Confederate flags flying not in some distant place, but in Alexandria, Virginia, right across the river from the Capitol. And on May 24th, 1861, they took them down. A dashing military man from a Zouave unit. These are the brightly dressed in the French style uh, units that you saw at the beginning of the Civil War before they realized that wearing bright colors in battle isn't exactly a good thing. But one of these Zouaves, a friend of Abraham Lincoln, indeed, Major Elmer Ephraim Ellsworth, was determined to remove that flag, particularly from one of the city's hotels. He did and carried it gleefully only to face the shotgun of the innkeeper who was not pleased with the removal and blew Major Ellsworth away. In doing so, that innkeeper created a martyr. Ellsworth was the first Union officer killed. Union troops declared martial law in the city. But it's no good to declare martial law if you can't tell anyone that you have. So, they went to the Alexandria Gazette and ordered the publisher there to print the statement about martial law in the city. 
The publisher, Edgar Snowden, yeah, I know, (laughs) funny last name, right? Edgar Snowden said no. And in fact, we're closed right now. Press is closed. Shut it down. Major Colonel Orlando Wilcox, you know, again, thinking about their fellow major who had just been killed, set a standard for press relations, ransacking the office and smashing the printing press to bits. Later, when a different newspaper, the local news, published an offensive editorial, the Union troops would set it ablaze. This was not totally uncommon. Uh, Ulysses S. Grant, as a general, ordered the shutdown of the offending Boonsville Press newspaper and threatened other papers that came to its defense and dressed down the editor of the St. Louis Daily Evening News for saying that Missouri was under a reign of terror. The Louisville Courier is viewed as a secession press by Northern editor and war supporter Horace Greeley. He's constantly condemning it. A union supporter in Louisville sends the editorials from the paper to the Secretary of State Seward and asks if the editor should not be in prison. The people, he said, can't send their sons to fight the rebels while this editor is allowed to furnish and comfort the enemy. The U.S. Postal Service promptly banned the courier from the mails. Then, federal authorities raided the newspaper's office, and they charged editor Dervet with treason. Now, friends of Dervet in Kentucky tried to convince Lincoln to let him out of jail. But after hearing from other friendly Kentuckians, Lincoln refused to intervene. President Lincoln said that he, oh, didn't have time to follow the newspapers the way like his supporters did, but he did peruse them. Here's what Harold Holzer says in his book, Lincoln and the Power of the Press. A visitor to the White House said, one Sunday, Lincoln took the newspapers from his drawer and read them to the very last word. When he was finished, his face flushed up with indignation and he hurled the pile of papers to the floor. His anger focused on Henry Ward Beecher of the New York Independent. Is thy servant a dog that he should do this thing? Within a second, however, Lincoln's dark mood disappeared. But he did work the press too. Lawrence Gubright, uh, running the Associated Press Telegraph, found him courteous but distrustful. He would slow narrate, according to Gobright, and was wary of leaks. One of his secretaries, Nicholas Hay, would serve as press liaison, giving reporters some access and maybe even an insider story or two about what was going on in the White House, but he'd also discourage negative stories. You know, nothing there, nothing here, nothing there. And Lincoln employed another tactic. He outright bought good coverage. In the run-up to his campaign for president, he had invested in the German-language newspaper of Heinrich Theodore Canisys. It was an important organ in Springfield, in Illinois, and in the Iowa and Indiana German communities. In 1859, through his banker, Lincoln bought Canisys' printing equipment out of Hock. Uh, He had gotten into a bit of debt and got him publishing again. Warned by others that Canisys might be a Welch, he signed an agreement with him that he must publish a newspaper. Okay. But to make it more helpful, Lincoln instituted a drop-dead clause. Should there be a departure from Republican brand, should he publish anything designed to injure the Republican Party, Lincoln would take the press away from him. Was it buying coverage? Well... Yes, in the same way that Jefferson, Jackson as well, did some of. Jackson had his own newspaper that would print essentially the government's view of things, the administration's view of things. Jefferson, we know, funded Calendar and a few others, just as Hamilton was doing. He also got jobs for newspaper men. Noah Brooks of the Sacramento Daily Union was so pro-Lincoln and the White House admired his article so much that he was given a job as clerk of the house. And it's possible he dangled an ambassadorship to France to secure the usual critic, James Bennett of the New York Herald, not a Lincoln fan, to calm him down a bit. 
if he did this, and there's some dispute, there are a few letters going back, there's no direct, you know, smoking gun, so to speak. But if Lincoln did this, he didn't get a praising editorial, but merely uh, on the choice of Lincoln or McClellan in 1864, Bennett said, it was a choice of evils rather than excellences. Still, given how badly Bennett had pummeled the Lincoln administration, this was kind of like an endorsement. The ambassador position was never given. And Lincoln's uh, actions were not alone, as we reference Jefferson Jackson involved in that. Lyndon Johnson owned a TV station in Austin, Texas, and held a merger up once until a newspaper publisher decided to give him more favorable coverage. But newspapers in modern times were not the most vulnerable targets. TV networks had a lot more to lose because for TV networks, we're talking about they're getting a license from the FCC. And the Nixon administration had no qualms about threatening where licenses would go for various network affiliates. It's possible that his intimidation of CBS may have led the network to stop analyzing the president's speeches directly. Was his Republican predecessor better? (laughs) Ostensibly, Theodore Roosevelt was a reporter's dream. As New York police commissioner and U.S. civil rights commissioner, he loved reporters. He gained a lot from them, and he was great news. I mean, waking up sleeping cops, enforcing the laws, holding politicians to the laws he made in both of those jobs. Now as president, when he saw reporters in the rain waiting in the White House, he set up a place for them within the White House. And it's that letting the journalist in the building that continues as a tradition today. But there was a dark side to the Rough Rider. Sure, he told reporters David Barry of the New York Sun and Ed Keene of Scripps that they would get access to good information as long as they observed a couple of rules. They could never quote that material came from him. And of course, they would be accurate and fair about what they reported. Those were the rules. And if he did not, um, if a reporter did not follow those rules, he would not only stop talking to that reporter, he would rebuke you. Uh, Reporters joke that it was the the Ananias Club, after a biblical reference after the fellow who held back a gift that was intended for the church. For his cousin, Franklin Roosevelt, they called it the Giggle Club. <laughs> Although it wasn't all giggles. It was just that Roosevelt created a cadre of reporters um, through his own personal charm, but also a kind of self-enforcement among them that the reporters would ask good questions generally good coverage and not confronting the president. And of course, just as with TR, no one would source the president. Reporters describing it at the time talk about how more of a self-enforcement, like if a reporter got out of line, they'd be talked to by their own members of the press. Like, why are you giving FDR such a hard time? And not so much directly from the president. But occasionally he would rebuke reporters. It was a mechanism of enforcement doing things like this, ridiculing reporters that might get out of line. Um, we had a similar thing with uh, Lyndon Johnson. You know, David Halberstam, in his great book, The Powers That Be, talks about how reporters going to Vietnam, let's say from Washington, to go report on Vietnam. Lyndon Johnson would insist on meeting with those reporters. Don't be like those boys Halberstam and Sheehan, he would warn. They're traitors to our country. Here's how uh, Halberstam talks about the Vietnam era. In the White House was committing not just men and resources to Vietnam, but its credibility as well. It was putting its word against a handful of reporters in Saigon. In the beginning, it looked like an absurd mismatch. For more than 20 years before, Americans had trusted the word of their president. The president knew he had all the information. It was a bit like Watergate. In the beginning, everyone believed the president. 
The polls reflected that. There were Rusk and McNamara and Bundy on television explaining how well the war was going. Who could make the case against them? These reporters were young and unheard of. Their sources worked deep in the bowels of the American operation in Vietnam and gave information, usually very good information, only in exchange for anonymity. Halberstam's story about reporter at this time, young reporter Dan Rather, who being from Texas and having earned his fame, being the person in Dallas covering the desk when President Kennedy was shot, is brought to Washington. Here's how Halberstam talks about Dan Rather. Rather, in those days, was the most junior of the network correspondents, and his CBS colleagues remember that the edges were still rough, the blue suit a little shiny, the country still showed. Curiously, being the outsider, the graduate of backcountry school instead of Harvard, some of the advantages of Eastern sophistication that haunted Lyndon Johnson bothered Rather, too, because he lacked them, a sense that Easterners had more and knew more than he did. But in this case, instead of poisoning him, it seemed to give him an added edge. But Johnson from the first misread him, thought he could have a slice of him, and greeted Rather accordingly. Lyndon Johnson was glad to see Dan Rather. Lyndon Johnson knew he could count on Dan. He was not like those Eastern boys who didn't understand a Texan. You understand me, and you're going to help me. Rather winced at that. Oh God, I'm really in for it now, he thought. It never worked well, not from the start. His position was difficult. Great newspapers do not like their White House reporters to be in an adversarial position with the White House. Networks, being more timid and more accountable to the government, like it even less. So his problems were potentially dual. Difficulties with the president could easily become difficulties with his superiors. He was thus more vulnerable than the average White House correspondent. The first attempt at branding took place very early, at the first White House press conference rather covered. Lyndon Johnson simply refused to see him or acknowledge his question. For a print reporter, this might mean very little, but for a network journalist, it is absolutely shattering. All his bosses were watching. A lot of institutional manhood was riding on it, and it was imperative for rather to show that he had the clout to do his job. So while his CBS boss, bosses gathered around the tube in New York, Dan Rather again and again kept jumping out of his seat as if there was a spike in it, trying to get to the attention of the president, but to no avail. Johnson recognized his main competition, Nancy Dickerson, and even worse, by name. Yes, Nancy. And he decided he could not let this happen again. He sought out Jack Valenti, considered friendly to reporters. He laid it out for Valenti. He thought this was deliberate. And if it was, then he, Dan Rather, was going to kick back. No one was going to ignore him. But Valenti was very soothing. Rather, you're wrong. Johnson's not against you. Johnson likes you. He thinks a lot of you. You remind him of young friends he had known in Texas. The problem was the president's eyesight. He had a terrible problem with his eyes and could not see 10 feet without his glasses. He was looking for Rather, but had been unable to see him. Now, these other reporters, he knew them because of their outlines. Their shapes were familiar. So, Rather knew that Lyndon Johnson was putting a mark on him, teaching him a lesson before the assembled multitude of CBS executives. And Rather found that at the next press conference, he was quickly recognized, even though he was seated much farther back. The president's eyesight, he noticed, had greatly improved. Desk assignment today, and uh, there was no reporter present from the post. 
everyone clearly understood that from now on, ever, no reporter from the Washington Post is ever to be in the White House. Is that clear? Absolutely. Yeah, and, and in terms of some intimidation of reporters, you know, the Nixon administration engaged in such activity as well. Daniel Shore is probably the more famous case. This from a 1973 Atlantic Monthly article. As Shore recalls the sequence of events, it began on Tuesday, August 17th, 1973, when Nixon, in a speech to the Knights of Columbus, promised that you can count on my support to help parochial schools. The producer of the CBS Evening News, The Walter Cronkite Show, called Shore and asked for a follow-up story. Shore went to see the source, a Catholic priest active in the field of education, who told him the administration was doing nothing to aid Catholic schools. On Wednesday night, CBS ran a film clip of Nixon's speech promising to aid parochial schools, then cut to Shore saying, there is absolutely nothing in the works to help these schools. Shore was summoned to the White House and met with Pat Buchanan, Terry T. Bell, the commissioner, deputy commissioner for education, Henry Cashin, an assistant to the press secretary. They began reading figures off very rapidly. He suggested to Shore that they put their main points down on paper and then Shore would try to get it on the air. On the same day that Shore was summoned to the White House, a member of the White House staff requested the FBI investigate the CBS correspondent. And Friday morning... When Shore reports to CBS Studios in Washington, an FBI agent was already there questioning William Small, the head of the CBS Washington Bureau. The FBI man said, I don't know, except it has to do with government employment. Then the agent wanders over to Shore's desk and started asking routine questions about his age, his family, his occupation. Shore is there and he begins answering and then suddenly stops and says, I'm not going to talk anymore until you... Mr. Agent, specify what employment you're talking about. Since the agent could or would not, Shore refused to answer any further questions. The FBI agent says, is that what you want me to report? Yes, Shore says. Do you mind if I ask other people about you? Yes, I mind, Shore says. Shore explained to the agent that he was in a highly visible occupation. It would soon get around that he was being investigated and it might seem as though he was looking for a job. And that could be harmful to his reputation. All the rest of the day, Shore said, calls came in from all over from people who said they've been approached by the FBI. Fred Friendly, former president of CBS News, called from his vacation home in New Hampshire. Bill Leonard, Gordon Manning, both vice presidents of CBS News, were contacted by the FBI. Then he discovered the FBI talked to his neighbors. Well, the best way to respond in this case was to turn it into a story. And on November 11th, the Washington Post published a detailed front page story about the FBI investigation. The story said the probe had been initiated by the office of Frederick Malik, a personnel man in the White House. In the press briefing that day, White House reporters are asking Ron Ziegler, the press secretary, you know, what job did you going to give Daniel Shore? The, the Nixon hates him. What is this? You know, oh, it's a job in the area of the environment. And we're searching across the nation for qualified people. It was later described of a breakdown in communication between the personnel office and the FBI. There was an investigation by uh, Senator Sam Irvin. And, you know, this uh, coming all at the time of uh, Watergate. Generally, when you think of John F. Kennedy, you're thinking of a president who during his time must have had great relationships with the press. And indeed, you know, he was a news item. He was somebody that reporters like to cover. But one also has to consider that much of the Kennedy strategy from the very beginning was going over reporters' heads. Kennedy held dozens of press conferences while he was president. Those did take the reporters out of the equation and put the president directly to the American people, a strategy that has since been the M.O. of almost every president. Where Kennedy did have some trouble is with the newspapers. He felt that many of them were Republican-owned, biased against him. And after the Bay of Pigs, he did have a bit of a testy speech with the National Press Club. Here's Kennedy 
The very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society, and we are as a people inherently and historically opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and secret proceedings. There is very grave danger that an announced need for increased security will be seized upon by those anxious to expand its meaning to the very limits of official censorship and concealment. That I do not intend to permit to the extent that it is in my control. But I do ask every publisher, every editor, and every newsman in the nation to re-examine his own standards and to recognize the nature of our country's peril. In a time of clear and present danger, the courts have held that even the privileged rights of the First Amendment must yield to the public's need for national security. But Kennedy does say this in the speech. If the press is waiting for a declaration of war before it imposes the self-discipline of combat conditions, then I can only say to you that no war ever posed a greater threat to our security. If you are awaiting a finding of clear and present danger, then I can only say that the danger has never been more clear and its present never more imminent. I have no intention of establishing a new office of war information to govern the flow of news. I have no easy answer to the dilemma that I have posed, and I would not seek to impose it if I had one. But I am asking the members of the newspaper profession and the industry in this country to re-examine their own responsibilities, to consider the degree and the nature of the present danger, and to heed the duty of self-restraint, which that danger imposes on us all. So even John F. Kennedy, who one probably thinks, you know, got pretty good coverage maybe and, you know, was a friend of the press, you know, had his issues. And one of the other things that uh, Kennedy was fond of is is inviting reporters who maybe weren't the star reporters of the organization and giving them access to the president. Uh, One famous example is that and, and I think it even survives to today that, that Kennedy is a speed reader. But really, Richard Reeves kind of checked this one out. We really only know that he told a reporter that, and the reporter printed it. So doing such favors to the reporter could be just as strong of an action as intimidating reporters, and it intimidates their competition. And there are always things, I think, that we should be on guard for in a democracy just as much as we, this is an obvious statement of disdain for the press. A bit about the history of the presidents and the press there. We could talk for a long time on this. I had a conversation with Chris Novembrino. You know him. Don't worry about the government podcast. We talked about a bunch of these issues, so I'll give a listen. So I am joined today by Chris Novembrino of the Don't Worry About the Government podcast. You know him. He is also the author of the My History Can Beat Up Your Politics theme song. And he is the host of the All in the Family podcast. So, Chris, thanks for coming on the show. And thank you for keeping up with my resume. It's ever-expanding, so it's (laughs) not always the easiest thing to keep up with. I have a hard time keeping up with it. Well, let's talk a bit about sedition, shall we? Because why not? Oh, Uh, yeah. I'm into it. We have uh, a president now who has really, in a departure from anything that I can think about in at least recent history, um, attacked the press in statements and really even attack the concept of freedom of the press as and trying to kind of isolate and disconnect it from from the first amendment in various tweets and statements um what's your what's your take on that and how how has it impacted how the media is behaving if at all i think that's always the interesting question that second one i his statements about the press I mentioned on an earlier episode, if he had a magic wand and could will them to be, they're quite alarming. I mean, he has talked openly about changing libel laws so that he can sue people and make a lot of money off of suing people for printing things that he thinks are mean against him. He recently, on August 31st here, was complaining about off-the-record comments being made on the record when it's almost certain that he was the one who was leaking them, but this whole concept of off-the-record, on-the-record, he's kind of wishy-washy on that. He talks on September 4th here of this month 
<laughs> MSNBC, maybe their license should be looked at. And same with CNN. He has made a lot of very alarming, if taken at face value, statements. Uh, the issue has been, and this is kind of the issue in this conversation, is when it comes time for him to execute on these he hasn't shown a lot of ability or even necessarily interest to execute on them beyond making the statement. How would he get a libel bill through Congress, especially now? Yeah, it's it's just that it's alarming to our ears. Uh, oh, sure. To hear anyone say it, and 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 the political dynamics, right, are um, are certainly um, withstanding. You know, I, I guess you could you can imagine, let's say, uh, midterms go the opposite of what most prognosticators think let's say there's a not only a stave but you have a uh, 1934 or 2002 or 1998 type situation where the president's party actually gains seats in an election and now <laughs> he approaches what will be a new speaker in congress i guess it would be um at that point it would be mccarthy if they win that if the gop wins maybe the jim House, jordan maybe jim jordan and they now it's a very different situation. So, yeah, it's it's not a lot to hang the hats of people who would seek to defend the press on just the current political dynamics. But these yeah, these statements do get awfully scary. I have heard um, uh, the Road to Now podcast, you know, has interviewed various, you know, Washington uh, correspondents um, and um, at different times. I I know that, you know, he, he does seem to talk to the press. So for all the vaunted attacks on the press, it's the other his, part of this. <laughs> he's, he does seem to like talk to the press an awful lot. Like actually among modern presidents, although he doesn't give as many press conferences per se, there's a lot of informal ones. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of after the, after the statement, uh, reporter, you know, he's, he tends to take questions in the hall, you know, and this is something that just there's a long history of, you know, the White House staffers do not want that president answering questions. And whether it's Reagan or Clinton or or others or even Trump, it appears, you know, presidents just seem to like to take that question from the from the white uh, from the reporters. Yeah. President Trump also likes to do long form interviews with outlets like The Wall Street Journal or Bloomberg. And in the case of Bloomberg, right, this off-the-record quote, who leaked this to the media, this off-the-record quote about trade in Canada, the most likely suspect is, in fact, Donald Trump, because why would the press just leak this random thing? I don't even entirely remember what he said about Canada, because these things sort of come and then they go. That is the tricky part. In putting this together, I have an article from ProPublica back in 2016, and they talk about Donald Trump and the return of seditious libel. This article is alarming. It reads a lot like something that could have been written here in 2018. Here's an excerpt. Asked in June if his stance on the press would continue as president, he said, Yes, it is going to be like this. You think I'm going to change? I'm not going to change. He repeated his view that, quote, I'm going to continue to attack the press. I find the press to be extremely dishonest. I find the political press to be unbelievably dishonest. In August, he tweeted, quote, It is not freedom of the press when newspapers and others are allowed to say and write whatever they want, even if it is completely false. He's been saying this for a very long time. Yes, it's a very big departure, I think, historically from what is always a contentious, confrontational, tense relationship between the White House and the press. Almost always with every president, even even, even Obama. presidents. Oh, even Obama and 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 Clinton. I mean, certainly a very tense relationship to the point that one of the major scandals of the White House uh, in in, Cl in Clinton's time that would get him tripped up when Republicans then had the uh, House and could investigate things was the White House Travel Office, where they replaced members of the Travel Office in the White House. That was important because that's where the reporters went to get their tickets to go follow the president at different places. And they liked the people in there. And that generated a lot of tension between the president. You know, Stephanopoulos referred to it as they had declared war on the on the White House press corps when they did that. So there was a lot of tense uh, times. Um, 
Hillary Clinton or someone at the Clinton White House had suggested closing the door between the area where the uh, uh, press secretary makes the conference, um, where you now see Sarah Huckabee Standard, Sanders speak from, and the press secretary's office, the uh, the office in the in the West Wing. And just that little, they liked the reporters the ability to follow the press secretary and ask a follow-up question once in a while. And there was talk of of closing that door, and that became a huge issue. So we've always had this tense relationship. This is a little different historically because this is an attack on not just some stories, but on the press in general, how they operate and their freedom to do so. And it's not just a complaint about the press or a complaint about the coverage. It's an attack on even the press having the ability to do what they do. He has moved from the fourth estate to literally calling the press the enemy of the people. And that is a far cry from this. And and I think what's interesting about the sedition issue, um, particularly with the Trump and the Trump families, intense interest in this problem is, as you discuss on the history side of this show, there isn't necessarily Supreme Court precedent around this in the way you might think because the Alien and Sedition Act predates Marbury versus Madison. So there have been various rulings throughout time, including New York Times versus Sullivan, which is probably the big sedition touchstone that was back in 1964. But to bring it back to the Trump people, Melania Trump's libel lawyer, when she was suing the Daily Mail in Maryland for a story about her modeling days, her lawyer wanted New York Times versus Sullivan to be overruled, wanted overturned. And this may be surprising to some people, especially since this idea of freedom of the press and the ability to criticize the government seems so inherently American. A lot of this stuff isn't codified. The Sedition Act is not settled law in the way you might think. Yeah, I think that for so long, uh, it's a troubling and tense aspect of any democracy is that the the press is not always viewed in a positive light. Um, Alexis de Tocqueville's famous book, um, the, the Visitor from France, Looking at American Democracy, uh, has both viewpoints that we still kind of see today and then the tense relationship that we see today in that Tocqueville was not really a fan of American journalism, but he was a fan of freedom of the press, but he, he made statements that were very, um, uh, cover, you know, between the two in that, uh, in fact, I'll see if I can get a quick one up here. Uh, I love that Bruce Carlson can just pull out democracy in America. <laughs> I confess that I do not entertain that firm and complete attachment to the liberty of the press, which things that are supremely good in their very nature are want to excite in the mind. So in other words, Tocqueville saying, you know, uh, I, I just don't get excited about that concept of freedom of the press because he's seen as so many other presidents we know over the story of John Adams uh, has seen that uh, what the press can do, um, and I approve of it more from a recollection of the evils it prevents than from a consideration of the advantages it ensures. Well, this is like Winston Churchill's quote about democracy being the worst system in the world, or capitalism being the worst system in the world, except for all the others. I think it's absolutely true, and it's the, the spirit of the journalist is to appeal crudely, directly, and artlessly to the passions of the people he is addressing, forsaking principles in order to portray individuals, pursue them into their private lives, and lay bare their weaknesses and vices. It's a very difficult and tense relationship. That's why I think it's important to go back to Tocqueville to see how long it has has been seen between the press and the government, because the press's very job will reduce in in almost any government in almost any time the stature of the government the authority of the government by poking holes in it and that was certainly the complaint of even george washington the first president i'm i'm being compared like a common thief or a a nero here you know (laughs) and uh and 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 the press was probably responsible among many other factors for his 
retirement after two terms. So Justice Brennan had an interesting quote at the end of that 1964 New York Times versus Sullivan ruling where he said that the Sedition Act was never tested in this court. The attack upon its validity has carried the day in the court of history. Well, what's interesting about that quote, and Brett Kavanaugh, as you'll hear in this clip that we're about to play, mentioned as well, is that the court of history is not an actual place. So I want to play this clip from Brett Kavanaugh, and then I want to get your reaction to it. We've witnessed unprecedented attacks on journalists and journalism over the past several months. Um, This should be concerning to everyone. Um, because the role of journalists is critical to our democracy. This is personal for me. Uh, My dad uh, was a journalist uh, his entire life um, and even wrote a blog. He's now 90 for a while. You probably didn't read that one, though. Uh, In New York Times v. Sullivan, uh, the court issued a landmark ruling in support of First Amendment protections for the press by affirming that when newspapers report on public officials, they can say what they want unless they say something untrue with, quote, actual malice, end quote. Under New York Times v. Sullivan, do you believe the First Amendment would permit public officials to sue the media under any standard less demanding than actual malice? And can you explain what that standard means to you? Well, the Supreme Court uh, has elaborated on and applied that standard repeatedly over time. I have, too, as a lower court judge, and that so that precedent is uh, now uh, been applied over and over and over again. I'm not aware of uh, much uh, effort to uh, deviate from that standard. Okay. In- interestingly, in New York Times versus Sullivan, the court in the course of that opinion, said that the Sedition Act of 1798 had been overturned in the court of history, which I thought was an interesting turn of phrase in the New York Times versus Sullivan. Of course, the Sedition Act was the act that said that criticism of public officials was uh, illegal in the United States in, in 1798, never actually struck down by a court. But the New York Times versus Sullivan made, made clear that that Act had been overturned in the court of history. Okay. Yeah, well, I think that it's, uh, uh, first of all, any, you know, like any good Supreme Court nominee, uh, he's trying to dodge from making a statement as much as he can and finding what positive he can say without taking a personal position on it, right? In other words, hinting at precedent without there being actual precedent. But I listen to that and I think that a statement like that in a court uh is precedent i mean that would be my feeling and that many plaintiffs and defendants in the future will be using that statement as precedent uh anyway in other words that that because one thing that a statement like that does in a supreme court decision i would argue is reduce the need for a future court to decide even further um this is actually an interesting time for a president to be uh, feel this way about the press and press freedoms, because in terms of the general concept of freedom of speech, this court, uh, the Roberts court, has been a, a very strong defender of that uh, concept. And if you uh, look at the um, Westboro Baptist Church decision, I mean, not even one that I agreed with, but an extreme um, uh, defense of uh, freedom of speech. If you look at Citizens United now, you know, far be it from us to to this is this is going to be an interesting point for a lot of people on the left that they're going to be maybe at some point taking refuge in the Citizen United's decision. But the very reason for that decision, even though it was about campaign finance directly and even though it's mostly been about uh, it's been it's been something celebrate if celebrated by anyone celebrated by conservatives for corporate speech the reason kennedy came down on that decision was that he he thought about the example of say the new york times and that there could be a real codified um corporation that would need freedom of association protection for its speech otherwise people would say your individual reporters have freedom of speech but you the new york times do not so the Roberts Court has actually been very defensive of freedom of speech. So it's an interesting time to plant a president now into the mix that is uh, attacking press freedoms. Yes, and it would be interesting to see how far this would get challenged. I, I think, okay, so I don't anticipate uh, 
Donald Trump trying to get a piece of libel reform through Congress, and I think even in kind of the most fortuitous circumstances where Jim Jordan becomes Speaker of the House and they still hold the Senate, I think it would be fairly tricky to actually get a libel law that would pass constitutional muster, but what I could see happening is a legal challenge, maybe perhaps through Melania even, to New York Times v. Sullivan. And I mean, maybe this is just a byproduct of the Trump era. I find myself thinking that everything that's not nailed down can be taken from the House right now. So when I see this loophole of the Sedition Act being tried in the court of history and never actually tried at the Supreme Court, I'm very worried that someone looks at that and goes, huh, well, the court of history is not a real place. Yeah, I I do agree that if, if we're talking about Kavanaugh's mind, let's say, uh, he might be, he could be going either way. He could be signaling that, are, are you crazy? That's decided precedent. Here's what that court said. Or he could be setting him up for a later time when, well, there really isn't any precedent. And I didn't lie in my hearing. He does seem to have a bias towards if it's not explicitly spoken on, it can be re-aired at the Supreme Court. Uh, yeah, I, I think like, and, and you're getting, uh, you're, you know, you're certainly going to get then uh, you, you might say uh, some interesting. It's going to be some interesting dynamics. I, w- you know, if, if a libel case about a public official comes to the court, I still think this court is going to be. You know, that might be him if if what you're saying is correct, and Clarence Thomas perhaps uh, going seven two. Um, I, I think that there's a, there's so, so, but again, I never, you know, we don't want maybe Gorsuch too. We don't know where Gorsuch would land, but I, I'm with you that I think that this is probably a six, three or uh, Roberts is not going to allow this line to get crossed. That is my gut instinct. Well, but you want to, uh, and then that's certainly the case, but I almost think that is like, even it's not even getting to Roberts. I, I believe. But again, we don't want to be too comfortable with just current political dynamics. You have a president who I believe historically is pushing the envelope. In other words, in turning something that has been present, I'll have a few uh, examples of of really playing hardball or different type of games with the press and not treating the freedom of the press as this noble concept like we're talking about. To someone who, as in so many things, has been more expressive, almost to to say a uh, uh, a very uh, on the good side bold, on the bad side cartoonish, perhaps level of expression about what I I say, what I feel, and this is how I feel about it. Um, whereas we, you know, there are a, a, a group of presidents who have had a relationship with the press that or a view of the press that is not exactly in tune with the, the First Amendment in, the, in their actions. I think the last three presidents honestly have been fairly rough on press freedoms. It was rough during the Bush era. The Obama administration, I think one of the cognitive dissonances that a lot of people who are left of center like myself deal with is that Barack Obama talked a really good game, but in practice, he was pretty aggressive against press press freedoms and was not afraid to use the Department of Justice to go after journalists. I mean, and now we move to Donald Trump, and Donald Trump is obviously more bombastic on it. Let's just read his tweet from the fifth here, because we need to talk about this, too. To bring this out of the hypothetical that Kavanaugh is talking about and why it was on Kavanaugh's plate in the first place, this anonymous op-ed in the New York Times. So on the 5th of September, Donald Trump says, does the so-called, quote, senior administration official really exist, or is it just the failing New York Times with another phony source? If the gutless anonymous person does indeed exist, the Times must, for national security purposes, turn him or her over to the government at once. Right. Now, I know most of us read that and go, okay, but that shouldn't be taken literally. But let's stop and actually take that literally. Uh, Trump is charging that the New York Times is making up sources. Like That's where this libel stuff comes in. He claims that the sources are phony. 
And then he claims that the New York Times needs to hand over the source for national security purposes. There's not a legal argument there for that. But the New York Times is scared enough that they said, we're confident the Department of Justice understands that the First Amendment protects all American citizens and that it would not participate in such a blatant abuse of government power. The president's threats both underscore why we must safeguard the identity of the writer of this op-ed and serve as a reminder of the importance of a free and independent press to American democracy. Yeah, I think where you get into potential danger is if we, we, we you know, we, we've been, in a sense, at war for a long time, but things have settled down, at least on in this side of the world. Um, you know, it's not settled down if you're still serving, say, in Afghanistan. But uh, uh, at the time, during the early Bush administration, those early days after the attack on 9-11, you could see where if, a, if, if, if Bush had, was making statements like that, there might be a little more go along with it. Like, look, I need to figure out uh, for, the, for combating terrorism, I need to know right now who made this statement. And so Trump is sort of uh, pushing at at wounds um, and and maybe making issues more clear that we need to defend against in a situation where it might be more real. I mean, that's the positive. If you get any positive out of um, the way Trump behaves, it's that perhaps in the future he's revealing he's like your um, he's like your cracker hacker. He's revealing the weak points in your democratic infrastructure so that if there's a less a uh, more skilled practitioner, eh, perhaps you'll be ready. Um, and that's one of the things that I, I think is why it makes it a complex um, debate. But certainly in what you're talking about, which is, hey, cough up the person who made this statement and bringing it more or less of a press freedom and more about a government um, action. In other words, it, and also making it more about the person than the media there might be some play there, and some of that might pass muster with the Supreme Court. In other words, if it's just about, I need to know who it is that made this statement. If it's about the president criticizing the president, that's one thing. But if it's about we're getting into a national security situation and someone reveals it, um, you know, courts might be a little more willing then to go with it. And someone like a Kavanaugh or Alito might be a little more willing to say, yeah, you've got to cough up the person or face the penalties. Um but in general, if it's about you need to cough up the person who made a criticism of the president, I think you saw in Citizen United and in some other decisions that that's we hopefully that's not the way it's it's going. I have found that in the past you talked about the the, the past presidents. Um, if you look at the Bush administration, if you look at so many of them in the past, if not in a direct attack on the press, there has been a lot of like manipulation of the press, which in a siege of the press, a siege of the press. Um, this actually has a, a not surprisingly a long history. No way. Things like uh, Ari Fleischer, who I think at different times, you know, uh, has been a, a sympathetic figure to Trump. And uh, yeah, he's still around. He's still mostly a Trump defender. I think that he's gunning for that point at which you know somewhere in 2019 or. Somewhere in 2023, as the there's like an uh, the last year of the Trump presidency, they need a press secretary. You know, maybe they call Fleischer in. Uh, he was uh, there was a situation where um, several situations where he played real hardball with the press, and they described it that way. There was a one Houston Chronicle reporter who um, asked a question, and Fleischer said, "Your question has been quote." Noted in the building, um, uh, Nixon kept a uh, kind of enemies list. Nixon, we know, uh, on the inside was writing all kinds of notes to his staff about different press and how they're enemies and how they're against them. And maybe a lot of it didn't go. We didn't get Nixon's feelings out in public. Uh, George W. Bush called a, a reporter a major league a-hole. We can't forget that. And even if he joked about it later and called the same reporter in a correspondence dinner a major league asset to the uh, newspaper profession, I still think you find that there's a more sophisticated game of opposition to the press going on with some past presidents. And uh, again, you know... Um, it goes all the way back. I mean, Kennedy a little bit. You know, come, come, Kennedy played favorites. He'd take some reporter that was like a nobody and bring him into the White House. 
that's almost as bad as attacking the press, in my view, because you're you're kind of uh, giving them favoritism over their their in, in, in you're clouding out the people who you don't want to cover stories because they're too good. Right, right. You know, this is the thing that makes it tricky when you're trying to weigh Trump's performance on the press versus Obama versus Bush's versus other presidents. I think, without a doubt, his instincts on the media are far worse. And it, as I've said before, the magic wand, if he had it, what he would do in terms of the fourth estate, I think would be very, very alarming to people across the political spectrum because it would be something we would identify as not very American. But when you get into these other presidents, it's a much more sophisticated dance and it's a much more competent dance. And this is really important when you're weighing this stuff out. We're looking at two years of Trump's presidency, not even two years of Trump's presidency versus eight years of Bush and eight years of Obama. They just had a lot more time to do a lot more things. And as rough as the Sean Spicer and Sarah Huckabee Sanders press briefings can be on the mind are they really necessarily massive affronts on press freedoms as a concept uh right i think that um you know when i looked at sean spicer uh when the from the beginning i i I even consider to be to be um kind here i I consider sanders to be a little bit of a lessing down from the way that the 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 kind of like three-point stance that uh Spicer had against the press. We didn't use chemical weapons in World War II. You know, you had a, you know, someone as despicable as Hitler who didn't even sink to the, to the, to using chemical weapons. So you have to, if you're Russia, ask yourself, is this a country that you and a regime that you want to align yourself with? I I think when you come to sarin gas, uh, there was no, he was not using the gas on his own people the same way that a shot is doing. I mean, there was clearly. I, I, I understand your point. Thank you. I uh, thank you. I appreciate that. There was not in the in the. He brought him into the to um, to the Holocaust Center. I understand that. But I'm saying in the way that the Assad used them, where he went into towns, dropped them down to innocent into the middle of towns. It was brought. To, so the use of it. And I appreciate the clarification there. That was not the intent. So well ridiculed in the Saturday Night Live bit that uh, I think it almost became something they couldn't continue. Um, I, I see that as a lot of uh, the beginnings to my chagrin, to my chagrin, <laughs> the beginnings of a new White House and experimenting with things. Um, I look at if, if George Stephanopoulos had tried that in 93, they would have they would have closed down that White House. I mean, it would have been over. It would have been kaput <laughs> for the for the Clinton administration. I mean, just not even possible to do. So I think so many times, though, uh, you're absolutely right to say he's had two. He hasn't had his eight years yet. There hasn't been, pray to God, no, there hasn't been a uh, major like attack on the, on the United States the way that it happened in the Bush administration. And I think that uh, so he hasn't had all the opportunities that we think. Um, and and he's always had a lot of opposition, even in his own party. And he's always had been under some investigations, which have. Um, so we don't know what the pure, you know, unrefined Trump policies on so many things are, or what he'd do if he had the ability to do it. You know, this is always the, the talk about Nixon, that Nixon was a liberal sometimes, but a lot of times it's just he never got his Congress. It's not just that Nixon was a liberal, too. I, I, to interrupt you here, because I've been studying him a bit more, it's that Nixon was a I alone guy. So what we now, I think, in our minds sort of realign Nixon as being almost kind of centristy with like kind of a weird Nixony flavor about it. But what he really was was a conservative Republican guy who believed very much in Nixon knows best. So there are times where Nixon needs to come in and do wage controls and price controls. And like, that's just what he's doing because he knows the right answer here. So that's where Nixon's liberal streak, I think, really kind of roots out of. Yeah, when you look at wage and price controls, there's a great issue, uh, for obvious reasons, not talked about as much as they used to, where you really see what an I alone uh, type mentality can do. Uh, no one talks about I mean, Jimmy Carter wouldn't have considered those. Um, well, I, I, I take that back to an extent. He was looking at it in, in healthcare and hospitals. 
but um, but in most areas you wouldn't consider the way that. But for Nixon, that was no problem because of an emergency, and there always will be emergencies, and we we haven't seen that. Um, one of the one of the things that I think about this whole discussion is uh, Trump appears to be radically different, and he is in a lot of ways. There's no doubt, especially personality wise. But I do wonder sometimes. Um, Bush looks in quotes so much quote better, especially people on the left are talking about, oh, I wish we had Bush back and, and things like that. I wonder, I think that Trump looks more radically different because he's coming after Obama. I do wonder if Trump had become president in 2009 after the Bush administration, if we wouldn't have just seen it as a little bit more radical version of some of the same. I mean, the- are we assuming in this example that Trump is having to fix the financial crisis? Yeah. Well, I'm not sure. You know, it's certainly possible that that could have been his ticket uh, if it were to happen. Right. He would come in and say, I alone could fix it. I, I just I think in that model, he would get in and be really overwhelmed by the financial crisis because arguably Barack Obama, who I consider to be a sharper individual on a lot of those matters, are more keen, certainly in terms of advisory and administrative stuff. Uh, he was overwhelmed by the financial crisis. The financial crisis was overwhelming for some of the best minds of that era. Ben Bernanke and other great economists didn't quite know what caused this subprime mortgage crisis or how to undo the damage now that the damage was done. They had good and educated guesses, and even then it took a while to get the car out of the ditch. By Obama's own admission. 2008 feeds into everything. There's no doubt that we had a devastating recession and the political class in Washington, perhaps because Barack Obama was elected and it felt like a change, like really ignored some of the stuff under the surface. I mean, that's almost at this point, that's almost a very basic comment to make. Um, I think everyone's learning that. What I more mean to talk about is that some things that appear mechanisms of the White House operation and things that are said in the press that appear to be a radical. If there were not a George W. Bush administration, we may not be starting, even with a Trump, we may not be starting in the same place. George W. Bush introduced sure, the concept definitely. of orange alerts. Now this week, you're on alert. July 6, 2004. Democratic United presidential States candidate America John Kerry Senator selects John Senator John Edwards, Edwards as his vice presidential running mate, producing a small bump in the election opinion polls and, and producing a huge swing in media attention towards the Democratic campaign. July 8, 2004. Two days later, credible reporting now indicates that Al-Qaeda is moving forward with its plans to carry out a large-scale attack in the United States. Homeland Secretary Ridge to warns of information about Al-Qaeda attacks during the summer or autumn. At their party convention in Boston, the Democrats formally nominate John Kerry as their candidate for president. The Department of Homeland Security raises the alert status for financial centers in New York, New Jersey, and Washington to orange. The evidence supporting the warning, reconnaissance data left in a home in Iraq, later proves to be roughly four years old and largely out of date. He introduced the concept of the greatest use of American force since Vietnam. He introduced the concept of really kind of, uh, even though he said he was against nation building, really taking over two countries in, in the Middle East, which was the you know, the opinion of a very fringe group within the Republican Party. So I think in so... And he... He established the interplay between the White House and Fox News, where there was this blurring between one of the estates of government and the fourth estate. Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, there again, if you talk about... Um, and yeah, and, and, and that's a great point to make. And, and also that he could uh, manipulate. The first episode of this podcast was about Bush and the media. And then, of course, I went into other presidents and talked about them. But that was the very first episode of My History Can Beat Up Your Politics, 2006. I felt strongly about it because um, I felt that he had was sort of using the the news um, and, and, and misleading uh, and planting stories in newspapers and then sort of like changing the statement that he had made. And this had to do with Iraq and Kemen. I don't even remember all of the details of the story at this time. But certainly things were not hunky-dory with the press. The relationship in terms of embedded reporters during the Iraq and Afghanistan wars was one of the most controlled 
um, of any recent presidency and certainly was different from the way that reporters covered Vietnam. Now, we know why that uh, presidency would like that. But I just think on so many fronts, the changes that we think are are so radical, and they are because we have this flashy personality. The way he talks about the press is radical, and the framework that he is giving his supporters to think about the media is radical. To actually say overtly that the press is the enemy of the people and to give people that notion, that has had real-world consequences, right? We've actually seen shooting deaths of press offices because of that framework. But to your point, in terms of actual practical policy, I think a lot of this stuff is baked in the cake. Why is Donald Trump able to go on Fox and Friends in 2015 and hit the entirety of the Republican audience? And not just in 2015, but in 2011 when he used to go on Hannity's show and really established himself as the birther guy. He was able to do that because Roger Ailes, as a byproduct of the George Herbert Walker Bush infrastructure, set up Fox News. And then George W. Bush and his presidency really established that marriage between a Republican White House and Fox News as their news media outlet. Fox and Friends is where Republicans go and get their morning news. And Donald Trump slides in in 2015, and that infrastructure is there for him to take advantage of. And that fact... um is also has very long roots in history. In other words, we talk about the media, and this is all alarming. And the reason it's most alarming to me, like so many Americans, is that uh, it's a direct attack on the concept of the press. Although the, the idea that presidents past would treat the press, say, in less noble concepts than the First Amendment might seem to call for, or American values might seem to call for, uh, after a view of history is not as surprising. And also, it, both in terms of attacking press, fighting with the press. Uh, I'm on record, for instance, back in 2009, I had said that uh, when Obama had made a direct attack on Fox News and there was a big to-do about it, I had said that it's fr- fairly normal and also okay for a president to, to tumble a bit, for White House to get into rumble a bit with the press. Um, fighting about the coverage is is okay there are consequences to it if you do it too much if your boy who cries wolf too much if everything's fake news for instance and there's a place for partisan media too i, I want to be completely clear like there's a place in my mind at least for the foxes and the msnbc's of the world we just have to know what they are and it has to be fairly clear there's a historic place too uh the reality yeah. is that uh That concept of starting, say, a media organization that's going to be a little more friendly to one side or the other has a really long history. I mean, Andrew Jackson virtually had his own uh, newspaper. Uh, It was the Whigs when in the few years that they were in control had theirs. Um, The every time that you see a newspaper across this country, there's still some that have the name Democrat in it, like Demo- the Arkansas Democrat Gazette is one. Like, that is a holdover to um, to where it used to be, that newspapers used to be party organs and were printed for that purpose, and their subscribers were much the same as political subscribers. So part of the media certainly is a, uh, is a political media, and there's all sorts of variations of manipulating... Um, the press and and getting favorable coverage that presidents engage in and using the power that they have, which is, uh, you know, you're not going to get covered by this White House if you don't, um, you know, if you don't give us favorable coverage. And that negotiation and trade has a long view in history. What this whole thing, the crux of everything we're talking about depends upon is this. Are we simply talking about a president who, because of his, the way that he is, his personality, is not articulating in a skilled way what he wants and therefore creating a statement that sounds like us at the end of democracy? Or is this the most scary thing that could happen to the republic? And I think that people who support the president, unfortunately, this probably more than any issue, don't have any choice but to say it's the latter. We, we, we have to react to something like that because it's hitting such a strong American value.
that, and you hope that, hey, oh, this guy just can't express well what he means. Right? They're not really the enemy of the people. He's just saying, like, the people that come to my rallies, you should be mad at the New York Times and cancel your subscriptions. But he's not able to articulate it that way. Bruce, I'm going to go back to this from the ProPublica article. In February, he pledged that, quote, one of the things that I'm going to do if I win, and I hope that I do, and we're certainly leading, is I'm going to open up our libel laws so when they write purposely negative and horrible and false articles, we can sue them and win lots of money. We're going to open up those libel laws so that when the New York Times writes a hit piece that is a total disgrace or when the Washington Post, which is there for other reasons, writes a hit piece, we can sue them and win money rather than have no chance of winning because they're totally protected. You see see with me they're not protected because i'm not like other people but i'm not taking money i'm not taking their money we're going to open up those libel laws folks and we're going to have people sue you like you've never been sued before okay well you know in a sense that goes to answer my question but i I think it is a little it is still more complex because i still think that's you know campaign um rhetoric and and you see you see even his perspective in that that he and this has been the whole mantra, this has been the mantra since 2015, that he didn't have a chance to win because so much of the establishment is against it, against him. And he's linking that press to part of the establishment, that one hit piece kills you. And certainly there were numerous uh, times where it looked like that was going to happen with Trump. Um, so he, that's his defense. He's also a person that throughout the history of his real estate career, you know, lawsuits have always been a has always been a feature of the Trump uh, Trump M.O., let's say. So uh, lawsuits are definitely a go-to for him. And he did that in 2006. So in 2006, he actually brings a lawsuit against Tim O'Brien over the book because it went after one of the things that Donald Trump is particularly sensitive about. In this case, it was about his wealth, and this book made assertions that Donald Trump is not worth nearly as much as he says he is. So Trump took Tim O'Brien to court over this, and his whole rationale for doing that, and this is ultimately why I think he wants to change the libel laws, it's not even about winning the suit because he knows that these claims aren't false. What he says, and he says it explicitly is he spent a couple of bucks on legal fees they spent a whole lot more i did it to make tim o'brien's life miserable which i'm happy about that's his quote yeah well i mean you know you're you're dealing with um a person who that that's certainly his mentality of course he's president now and not a candidate not a underdog he's in the position of government and i think that hopefully everyone changes their perspective on it. That wow, these statements made by a uh, uh, you know a real estate mogul who's had his ups and downs is one thing, and statements by a candidate even who feels like there's a big, uh, like so many candidates is going to use the rhetoric of the Washington establishment to bolster his campaign is another thing. But now you're in the presidency and. The lack of criticism of him is very dangerous, and everyone should flag it. I think absolutely no. I, I think your example of the cracker hacker earlier, that metaphor, that's a really, really strong metaphor for people to be focused on here because this has only ever been tested in the court of history and not the Supreme Court. And what Trump is exposing right now is something that I think is very important, press freedom. And if we don't come in after this moment passes and protect it, this really can be eroded away fairly quickly. Yes, I uh, I think, for instance, um, those that are saying the partisan press or even, you know, now we have so much media. There's so much variation. One of the things I got into in the episode is about Nixon and the chilling effect on the using FCC licenses and TV. But back then, uh, there were only a few TV stations. So you could almost even go with a president's argument a little bit. When bias was against them and they could make that case, there were only three networks. So it was really a lot of powerful people. Ken Phillips comes out with this book, uh, Mediocracy, which uh, which is like a kind of forgotten era. And there are a couple books like this. Uh, David Halberstam wrote a book called The Powers That Be, because I think after Watergate, there was some pushback that maybe the media is too powerful. It's nice that they took down a president. Maybe we didn't like the president, whatever. Uh, too powerful. So you're seeing uh, there was that where maybe, you know, and, and Kennedy had some of his problems with coverage at different times. So the argument you could make 
is that history has changed. We have so many more channels of communication now that suing one, so what? Shut down the New York Times. And I'm not saying you do this. Shut down the New York Times. That's just one. The New York Times is much less powerful than they used to be, by the way. They were very, very powerful in the 70s. The newspaper. They had everything. They knew everything. Kissinger was deathly afraid of the New York Times, finding out about like the China, um, the negotiations with China before anybody, because they were so good. They were like as good as the CIA. They probably had the CIA. So it was, uh, you know, newspapers, certain entities used to be powerful. They're certainly, they're still important, but less powerful than they used to be. We have thousands of media channels. But I do wonder then if, um, if I, if he gets what he, you know, if the danger is if, if what he's saying in tweets and stuff comes to fruition, you could start to centralize that decentralization, decentralization again, because so many people would be afraid to publish thing on their thousands of blogs and thousands of podcasts and things like that, um, because of being sued, say. But right, you know, so it, it should be cold comfort to any partisan media. Because partisan media is only as good as that first time when you're going to take on the person that you uh, originally were subsidized by. Yes. A uh, thing I routinely find myself drawing my mind back to is a sense of weird, cold thankfulness that Donald Trump doesn't have the competency of someone like Huey Long, because I actually think a lot of his impulses are really similar. Yeah, I mean, I think that the Huey Long makes a fine historical analog for President Trump and in terms of the way that he acts and terms of the way that he would just take down any opponent. You know, and um, the laws are in his way. Mm -hmm, and and that mm -hmm. is that's the tone you get from Huey Long. And that's certainly the tone you get from Donald Trump at times, particularly on this issue. Like the press laws are in his way. You could argue that he feels that way about the Department of Justice. And I mean, look at the way he talks about Jeff Sessions. Look at the way he talks about the Mueller probe. He seems to view that as an issue, too. But these are just standing laws. These aren't even necessarily laws that are coming after him. These are also obstructions. They're obstructions of his will oh absolutely there's no doubt it's exactly the same a uh, long uh did attempt uh did did well didn't attempt but didn't get there there was certainly talk of a right. long presidency of a, a long for president huey long um was uh, very uh the fdr was very annoyed by him because huey long claimed that he helped fdr get elected long did support fdr but in the way that you can imagine when trump endorses anybody it's kind of like, well, I'm doing this now, but you better be, I better have your loyalty. Um, and that's what happened with FDR, long endorsed FDR in 32. But by 36, had he not uh, died, he would have been, he would have been pulling away from that and probably challenging, uh, two FDRs left. Um, yeah, in, in 1940, especially with a little bit of that FDR fatigue in there, you could totally see Long being a very, very credible challenger to FDR, which is why FDR was alarmed by Long. Like, the, the Long was very much on FDR's radar. Huey Long has come a long way from the washroom of 1933. Popular response to his Share the Wealth movement floods his space in the Senate office building. What I called you about was to see if there's any chance of my getting anywhere at all to get a little more space around here temporarily. I don't know what to do. I'll put these people out in the hall and let these senators fuss and probably want to throw us all out of here. I don't know what we're going to do with it because we've got more than we can handle. I'm going to give up this office and the stenographers and move out to some place around the hotel. And now the Louisiana kingfish, having grown too big for Louisiana, too big for the U.S. Senate, eyes the biggest office in the country, the executive office of the White House. Today, Huey Long is the biggest single threat to the re-election of Franklin D. Roosevelt. Share the wealth he promises in specific terms. $5,000 a year, and every man a king. Thus, Huey Long revamps for his candidacy of 1936, the broad doctrine of social justice propounded by the candidate of 1932. Yeah, and I think that um, uh, that type of, uh, you know, he, he got pushed into things like Social Security and other activities because of Long, so that's a good side of it. But the bad side of it is there was a real danger. And Long was only killed by kind of a fluke um, thing where a... Um, uh, uh, 
guy was a dentist, right? Yes. Essentially, the guy was kind of politically charged and shot long, but that was the thing that derailed Huey Long's career. It wasn't anything political. Uh, correct. Well, I think, not overtly. I think having the state of Louisiana pretty much under his control, uh, I mean, Russell Long was a senator for much longer uh, after that, so there was certainly... Um, uh, really, uh, you didn't get Louisiana under that until the, like the 1970s. Um, so Lung family had a big influence and that could have extended to him. And that's an important state in the Democratic coalition at that time. Uh, yeah, FDR would have had a time with him because uh, he was stealing FDR's thunder as the, in, in terms of populism and, and like that. The person that shot him was... Um, one of the political rivals, a uh, family that had lost um, prestige and position because of um, Long, uh, that had been a, uh, in the legislature, the family members, and had kind of been outvoted and put to the side. There was a that uh, there was a person that was seeking to marry into that family, and obviously yes, had some issues yes. because if that's the way to earn your spot. Um, and this is what happens. It's a country that's always had availability of arms and in the wrong hands. Um, the mix of the arms and the public figures is not a good mix. Hey, Chris, really want to thank you for coming on the program. Chris Novembrino is the podcaster behind Don't Worry About the Government. Also, the All in the Family podcast. And he's the writer of the theme song for My History Can Beat Up Your Politics. Um, great to have you on, Chris. My pleasure as always, Bruce. Thank you so much. The website is www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com. Remember about the premium podcast. There's going to be additional conversations on there with Chris Novabrino. It's actually several of them in the archive that you can listen to. I mean, some of them are a little outdated. We'll be talking about the second debate of 2016 or what have you, but might still be interesting. So remember to subscribe to that, www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpoliticspremium.com. Thanks for listening.